Hare Krishna. Thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity to um, speak about Narutam Das Thakur. It's a pleasure for me and purifying. And I hope it will be also for you. Pravanchakopa Puru Gischa, Rupa Samadurvacha, Vidanam, Bhavanadia, Vaishnavadia. Well, big subject matter. The glories of Narutam Das Thakur are vast. <laughs> and we don't have a lot of time. Um, so I'll try to just hone in on a few specific things. Um, I'll try to focus on why Narutam Das Thakur holds a special place in our Sampradaya and kind of what were some of his very unique contributions. So I've identified six points that I hope to unpack somewhat in this talk. So the first point that sets him apart from the rest is that uh, Lord Chaitanya himself, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, singled him out in a very special way and empowered him in, in a very extraordinary way. So to explain that a little bit. And the, the second point that um, sets him apart is that he, um, he became famous for demonstrating deeply loving relationships with his gurus and his friends. And the third point is that he took on very heavy responsibility of bringing books to Bengal. And fourth point, which we're probably all aware of, is his that he became an incredible songwriter like no other. And the fifth point is his special contribution of inaugurating the Guapalini Festival. And the last point uh, I want to discuss is how unique and amazing were his departure pastimes. So we'll start Start with the first one, which is how Lord Chaitanya singled him out and empowered him in an extraordinary way. Um, so we'll try to tell in brief, you know, we can't tell all of these stories in pastimes, but at one point, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and his devotees were having kirtan along the bank of the Padmavati River, and suddenly Mahaprabhu became deeply emotional started crying and calling out Narutam, Narutam. It was bewildering and confusing to the devotees. And he fell on the ground and continued to cry. And Nityananda Prabhu, you know, got down on the ground next to him and tried to pacify him. And a discussion ensued where Mahaprabhu said, you know, Nitai, what will happen when we leave this world, what will happen to my mission? And Nitai said, well, only you know. Someone must carry it forward. And Mahaprabhu said, yes, there is someone very qualified, and that is Narutam. And that is who I'm calling for. And again, Nitai is puzzled. You know, I don't know of any Narutam amongst your associates. And he said, no, he's not born yet, but soon he will take his birth. And I now want to leave my love for him in the future. Again, this was puzzling to me, Dai. Well, if he's not born, then how will you leave your love? So then Mahaprabhu said, follow me. So all of the devotees went with Mahaprabhu to the bank of the Padmavati and Mahaprabhu walked in to the river as the devotees stood watching him stunned and they saw the water rise very high up and waves started to come and the Padmavati Devi actually appeared before the eyes of all of them and Mahaprabhu told her, I want to leave my love with you. 
And for Narutam, in the future, you will give it to him. She also was puzzled. How will I know who is this Narutam? Said, you will know. Your waters will rise up in the same way that they're rising um, today. And you will know. And you simply give this love. I mean, you know, this is a very mystical, uh, very mystical to understand what it was that Mahaprabhu gave her, how she held that. And, uh, but nevertheless, somehow this, uh, this transpired. And of course, uh, amongst the devotees, everyone was, uh, word spread, you know, far and wide. This amazing thing happened. <laughs> they all saw it happen. So they were waiting. Well, who is this person that will take birth? So, I mean, one thing about this particular pastime that I find interesting is that um, it shows us how Lord Chaitanya, even though he didn't really create a, you know, um, you know, a movement, a mission, you know, physically, he didn't write books, but he orchestrated everything very, very carefully so that his mission would, uh, would unfold as, um, as he desired. And, um, you know, there's so many examples, like when he sent Lokanath to Vrindavan, uh, he, this was his plan to revive Vrindavan at that time. It was, it was the forest mainly. And uh, instructing Rupa and Sanatan and that they should write everything and telling them what to write. And then he instructed Lord Nityananda and Haridas that they should stay in Bengal and they should preach. They should go door to door. And, you know, in so many ways, you see that although Mahaprabhu didn't write himself, just you know, a few verses, um, but he really orchestrated everything for the mission to unfold. And I find that comforting, you know, that this is how it works, you know, on through the ages, um, one acharya after another, they unfolded further and further. And this is all being orchestrated by Lord Chaitanya up to today. And, you know, that Mahaprabhu's plan is inching forward and he's orchestrating that. And um, we're part of that. And so it's interesting and enlivening, ecstatic, actually. <laughs> so as... Um, as Mahaprabhu predicted, Naratam was born soon after in the town of Khetri. And uh, he was born to Krishnananda Datta and Narayani. And uh, Krishnananda was a king of Khetri. So he was born into wealth and um, his family was very pious, very much loved. And so he immediately became the darling Rajkumar Narutam of the entire town. Of course, his parents, he was the only child. And it was apparently later in life that they had him. So the attachment, you know, very, very strong. And the love that flowed to him was very strong. And as a child, of, um, you know, he captured people's hearts by showing his like very devotional inclination. You know, in those days, people, what they did in the evenings was they went to Pravachans, they went and listened to Sadhu speak. So anybody passing through Kajri, uh, you know, they'd speak in the evening and Krishnananda and his wife would take Nartam by the hand, and he would sit next to them. And everyone marveled at how he listened so intently. And his parents were so charmed. Such a good boy. He will make a good king. And um, soon, 
one very great sadhu named Krishna Das, um, who was one of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's associates, he came to stay in Ketri and he saw Narottam's um, attraction for hearing about the sadhus. And so he started coming every day to the palace and he told Narottam everything about Mahaprabhu's mission, about Rupa, Sanatan, all the devotees, one by one, he told everyone's stories. And Narottam lived to hear these stories. He was riveted. And um, it wasn't just a, you know, child, it wasn't childish or casual interest. It was an obsession. And that he couldn't think of anything else. <laughs> And so, you know, as parents, after a while, they're like getting worried. Um, you know, it's a bit extreme. Um, so Krishnananda, he told Nartam, you know, Nartam, it's nice to hear about these sadhus. And they, we, we want to worship them. But, you know, we have our duties. We can't become like them. But... Narottam was, um, in his mind, even though he was just a little boy, he was thinking, well, I think I can, and I think I will. And so he had this determination, and he kept hearing at every opportunity. And of course, Krishnananda Dutta didn't want to disappoint um, you know, he didn't want to make an offense to the sadhu, so he couldn't really tell him, don't come anymore. Um, so Nartam continued to listen until one night he had a dream and Sri Nityananda Prabhu came in his dream and he told him, instructed him, Nartam, wake up, go to the bank of the Padmavati. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has left the most marvelous gift for you. Please go there now. And uh, Padmavati Devi will give this gift to you. So Narottam, in the uh, dead of the night, he secretly came out of the palace, went down to the Padmavati, entered the waters, and the waters rose up in the same way as Mahaprabhu did. And suddenly before him was Goddess Padmavati. And she gave Narottam this love of Mahaprabhu that um, was left with her. I mean, such a uh, mystical, very mystical experience. <laughs> very difficult to understand how she was holding that and how she transferred it, but indeed it happened. And from that moment, Narottam became a madman what his whole body was engulfed in the love of Mahaprabhu. You know, how could a young boy even contain such a thing? So he became like a madman, dancing, crying, laughing, jumping on the bank of the Padmavati. And um, very extraordinary experience that had come to him. And actually it's kind of a key to his nature to understand him as a person um, that what is it that that came into him really Mahaprabhu is the embodiment of selfless love that he came in the mood of Srimati Radharani that is the mood of Mahaprabhu's life. And so that is what that mood of, you know, selfless, pure devotion that you know, entered into Narta. And of course, after that, he was never going to be their little Naru, and he was never going to be the same. You know, that now there was like a fire burning in him. 
and that he just wanted to give everything. He wanted to give his life, his heart, everything to Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and his devotees. And he had this intense hankering to go to Vrindavan. Now you can imagine the parents, they were just shocked and, and worried, frightened, and they just could not understand what had happened to Narutam. I mean, they were devotional people. Um, but what Narutam was experiencing was beyond what almost anyone had ever experienced. They, they could not comprehend it. And, you know, they just kept telling him, but, but Narutam, um, we're devotional. We, we chant, we, uh, we can, you can serve Chaitanya Mahaprabhu here in your home. We worship a shalagram. We, you know, why can't you be a great devotee here in Ketri? And Narutam knew, you know, there's just no way they will ever, they will ever understand. They, they just could not understand this. And, you know, because they were so frightened, they had guards, they had to uh, put guards to always watch Nartan so that he wouldn't run away. And uh, so it was very difficult for him to get, get away. And of course, that's a whole story, which we can't tell all of it, but uh, he did manage to get away. And then, then getting away, he knew that he had to run because there would be people following him, many people following him. And so he couldn't go on the main road. He had to just run through the forest. And so you imagine this boy, young boy, pampered Prince, Prince Naru, Rajkumar, you know, just pampered his whole life living in the palace. And suddenly he's running barefoot through the forest. You know, it's pretty inconceivable that this young boy, I mean, it's hard to say what his actual age was. There's different viewpoints about it, but you know, young teenager, sometime in his teenage years. And, um, you know, where do you find water? How do you eat? You know, no lights, no roadmaps, no <laughs> nothing. And going from far end, one far end of the country to the opposite far end of the country, a long, long journey. And it was difficult and Narutam struggled. And, you know, there were points where he almost gave up. And there was at one point, he fell on the ground and was crying, oh, Vrindavan, will I ever reach you? Is it possible to reach you? And, and, and he just fainted, you know, on the ground. And suddenly came, was a, arrived there, was a, a young village boy with a pot of milk, and he woke Narutam and said, no, nah, not Narutam, but he said, wake up, take this milk. And Nartam saw this boy and he saw the pot of milk, but he was so tired that he couldn't even get up and drink it. And he fell back asleep again. And in a vision, Rupa and Sanatan came before him and they pacified him. And they, you know, they said, Nartam, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has brought milk for you. You are so fortunate. Just get up and drink it and take nourishment and go on to Vrindavan. You will. You will arrive in Vrindavan. We are always with you. And so Nartam woke and, you know, with great enthusiasm, he drank that milk and became very, very happy and energized and continued his journey on. And, um, well, indeed, it's a, a lesson also, this little pastime that... You know, as Prabhupada used to say that it's not easy to get a ticket to Vrindavan or to get to Vrindavan, that even such a great souls, you know, they face big struggles and disappointment, you know. So 
of course, we, you know, neophyte devotees, we will also face our struggles and our disappointments. And sometimes we might feel like we're crawling through the desert of anartha nirvriti. Um, but, you know, we can take heart that, you know, you stay on the path. And our eternal well-wishers, they will give help and they will provide some nourishment in one way or another. And so Nartam continued on and he made it to Mathura and there, you know, the ecstasy was just like his dream come true. Finally, he arrived and there he was hit with tremendous disappointment to find out that Rupa and Sanatan had left the world not, not long ago. Um, but again, he was, he got help from uh, a devotee in uh, Brahmana in Mathura. And he also had another vision in which all of the great souls who had already left the world, um, they encouraged him on, you know, so he continued on to Vrindavan. And um, interestingly, as he, you know, he ran across the whole country to get to Vrindavan. And, but when he started to get really close, he, he started to get very nervous and he started to walk very slow, you know, coming before all these Sunobi and the, the sacred Dham and all these great souls. Will they welcome me? Do I deserve to even be there? And um, so it's kind of a, a beautiful mentality that naturally um, comes upon someone who's about to come before greatness, real greatness, that you feel smaller and smaller uh, as you come before this great personalities and great sacred dham. And probably, you know, many of us have experienced in some small ways, you know, when you're coming to the dham or when you're going to meet some, you know, spiritual master. Or I remember when Prabhupada came to, um, came to Paris um, I just would constantly, I just wanted to see him or be with him or, you know, but I was a Pajari, Pajaris are busy. And so I was missing out, missing out on all the things, you know, the morning walks and so many things. And I just said, oh, I really want to see Prabhupada and be with him close. And then finally, the last night um, before Prabhupada was going to leave, I had the opportunity. Someone said, now go right now up to his room. So then I started to go up the stairs and then suddenly I started to go really slow. I just felt, and I just became overwhelmed with fear. And I felt as I slowly started walking up those stairs, I just felt so un unqualified. And I felt like I was getting smaller and smaller, like a little mouse that was going to crawl into his room, you know. So, uh, you know, it's natural, natural. But of course, when Nartam arrived in Vrindavan, he was welcomed, you know, with wide open arms by all the devotees, especially Sri Jiva Goswami. And um, because they had, they knew that they had heard about him. They knew he would come. And so his dream came true. There he was in Vrindavan with all these amazing devotees. And um, so that, that was the unpacking of the first point. And then the second point was that we, um, he became famous for his loving relationships with his gurus and his friends. And so then that um, became apparent in Vrindavan. That manifested when he was in Vrindavan that soon after his arrival, he um, met Lokanath Goswami. And immediately upon seeing him, his heart just exploded. And he understood, this is my spiritual master. This is who I want to give my life, my heart, my everything to. Now, um, as you know, most everyone knows, because it's very famous that Lokanath had, you know, he'd made a vow. He didn't want to take disciples. He didn't want to be famous. And so Naratan had to, but his, he, he, he wouldn't give up. He wouldn't give up. He said, I've given my heart. It's already been given. 
I can't take it back. So eventually he broke down the barriers and Lokanath had to surrender to the love of Narutam and break his vow. I mean, breaking a vow, that's a big deal for some sadhu. And, but Narutam got Lokanath to break his vow. And then he, at his initiation, Lokanath said, now I want you to go to Jiva Goswami and he will, um, he will train you. He will teach you. And because Sri Jiva Goswami, after Rupa and Sanatana left, he had been shouldering, you know, the whole mission of Mahaprabhu fell on his shoulders. You know, the, the finishing and the building of all the temples, the taking care of all the books, and copying them, writing his own books, everything fell in his lap. And so he also understood that apart from all of these things, that if he didn't train the next generation, younger people, then what would happen to the mission? So he opened the first school, I think it was called Rupa Vidyapit, and he took students and trained them in Gaudiya philosophy. And so Nartam um, became the Shiksha disciple of Sri Jiva Goswami. And again, their intensely loving re relationship unfolded with also the other students. Um, there, Narta met Srinivas and Shamananda, and they became lifelong friends. Later, he also had a very, very dear friend, Ramchandra Kaviraj. And these friends were his support throughout his life. So, um, He's also, he's famous for that, that he was so loving, you know, to not just his gurus, but also his friends. And they stayed with him throughout his life. And so he showed us, you know, what Vaishnava relationships can be and how deeply loving they should be and how they can be a support for someone's entire life. So that is another unique uh, feature of Narutam. And the third point that I wanted to unpack was how um, he was given this most important and very, very heavy responsibility of bringing books to Bengal. Now, you know, Narutam was living in Vrindavan, not thinking he was going anywhere, and he had a perfect life amongst the greatest souls. And he was really living in Vrindavan. He wasn't on the surface. He was actually in Vrindavan. He sometimes saw Krishna. He sometimes heard Krishna's flute. He understood his spiritual identity. I mean, he was in Vrindavan. And he had no intention of ever doing anything else. And then there was very suddenly a very uh, a huge and unexpected change. So at one Kartik festival, one actually, uh, it was during Kartik and it was coming up to Kartik time. And Sri Jiva Goswami announced that he wanted to have a big festival. So Nartam, Srinivas, Shamananda, they went out everywhere, far and wide, Radhakun, Mathura, everywhere to all the great devotees and invited everyone to come. And everyone wondered, hmm, what's up? Uh, why is Jiva Goswami calling everyone? You know, so they suspected something special was about to happen. And um, so during that festival, during the cartoon, as everyone came from far and wide, um, Sri Jiva Goswami stood up and he announced that for so many years, uh, we've been stockpiling books here in Vrindavan. We've been writing and just piling up books. Now it's time for them to go out. You know, the devotees, all of Mahaprabhu's devotees in Bengal, they're starving, waiting to hear all these, this nectar. So I want my best disciples, Srinivas Shamananda um, and Nartam, 
to take these books. So this was, wow, this was, they were stunned. They were stunned. Um, first of all, you know, to leave Vrindavan, well, that was a shock. And then on the other hand, such a glorious and important mission that they were to be entrusted with it was such an honor, you know, so they were all kind of just ripped in two <laughs> that, wow. Um, although they, they understood that we're gonna have to surrender to this. And however difficult it was to leave, you know, to say goodbye to Vrindavan, imagine, um, they didn't know, would they ever see Lokanath, Sri Jiva Goswami, any of these devotees again? And Nartam didn't. So <laughs> that leaving, what it must have been like, it's uh, inconceivable, inconceivably difficult. Um, and the journey itself, how difficult that would be, you know, because it was dangerous. I mean, again, they had to walk, you know, with this bullet cart and this books through very dangerous situations. And they had to enter into totally uncharted terrain, you know, that they had no experience for, you know, but they took it up. You know, so again, uh, with this pastime, it's a it's a lesson in love. What, what is the real thing? It's not what I want, but what does my beloved want? And that is the real expression of love. To surrender to that, and um, you know, all devotees to some extent have to face such a test. You know, we think of like Lokanath. He had to go to Vrindavan. He had to leave Mahaprabhu in Navadvip. <laughs> he didn't want to do that. And you think of Srila Prabhupada, you know, he didn't really want to leave Vrindavan. You know, and then Prabhupada, he also expected his disciples that they would surrender to things that he wanted and they didn't necessarily want. Like one time Prabhupada was on the train with his devotees um, and he just, it came up that maybe it was a good preaching field somewhere, maybe it was Delhi, I'm not sure. And he told Gurdas and Jamuna and maybe a couple others. He said, oh, you should get off here. You should get off here and open a temple. <laughs> so, you know, while the train is paused, they have to grab their belongings and get off into the unknown you know, pretty, wow, and they did it, you know. And then you think of someone like Tamal Krishna Maharaj, you know, just go to China. You know, there's nothing there. And Prabhupada said to do it, so, you know, he did it. Then there's uh, Mandakini, you know, such a wonderful mm -hmm. devotee. She, uh, Prabhupada said, would you go to Russia and marry this person that's not even a devotee? Prabhupada met one person when he went to Russia and he wanted to make him a devotee. And so he said, would you go marry this person? Yes, Srila Prabhupada, if that's what you want. <laughs> Whew. You know, so we, you know, well, are we ready <laughs> to do these kind of things um, to express selfless love? Not an easy thing. So, you know, they actually, you know, in setting off with all those books, um, they really had no understanding whatsoever what this journey would mean in the long run. You know, they, they didn't know where would it go. We're just carrying these books. But that it would actually set off a complete tidal wave of book distribution that would eventually flow out to the entire world that continues to today, where now over 500 million books are spread throughout the whole world. I mean, probably Nartam, Srinivas, and Shaman, they could not even have 
dreamed of such an outcome, you know, yet, you know, they just did it, not knowing what the result would be, just this is what our gurus want, and we just do it, you know. And we, you know, similarly, we also, we don't know how our service is going to impact the world in the future. And Prabhupada said it will. And so we just have to have faith, you know, in the service to our acharyas and Lord Chaitanya's plan. And um, things will unfold as the Lord desires. He's orchestrating it. So somehow, you know, the faith that those things will happen. And um, so then I'll move on to this fourth point about him becoming uh, famous for his songwriting, you know, which is really uh, a part of our daily life. You know, we connect with him every day, you know, the songs we sing. And I mean, we know how Srila Prabhupada, even though Prabhupada didn't talk that much about the life of Narutam Dastapur, he didn't really tell us that much, but he quoted his songs literally thousands of times. I think I did a search once, it was like over 2,000 times. Prabhupada said, Srila Narutam Dastapur said, Srila Narutam Dastapur said, so we know that he was very important, very important to Srila Prabhupada and very important to our whole Sampradaya, how he, um, how he became, you know, to write these songs, how he started writing these songs, um, you know, after this very harrowing journey, we won't go into it, but wow, they were faced with uh, the loss of the books and then again, the finding of the books. And then, you know, Nartam arrived in Kateri and he has to think, well, now what, what to do? <laughs> How can I share all these jewels of the Goswamis, all this philosophy? How can I share it with the most people? How can I spread it amongst the ordinary folks? And so he had to think, you know, he had to make an innovative strategy and, you know, make a plan that would be effective, you know. And part of that plan was to write songs. And in those songs, I mean, it doesn't seem like a big deal now, but in, at that time, it was it was new, you know, that you would speak all philosophy through songs that were written in Bengali, and that anybody could understand. So that was a, that was a, a unique way to spread things very far and wide. That it would be easy for people to hear these songs and then imbibe. And then in those songs, he would convey everything like the full encyclopedia, A to Z, or Z, from, you know, neophyte to Uttama, understanding like the full gamut of bhakti experience. And in those songs, there's quite a few different categories of songs. Um, one is the Dainya Bodhika, or the songs of profound humility, where he expresses, you know, oh, I've just spent my life uselessly. I drank poison knowingly. And he expresses all these. Um, it's hard to understand. It's a mystery how he could feel so lowly. Um, but this is something that it's called dainya. It's not ordinary humility. It's part of prema. And both dainya and prema, they, you don't have one without the other. They come together, you know, but these, although it's difficult for us to understand, we should know that these kind of songs, they, they're not, nothing to do with low self-esteem. They're they're ecstatic expressions, not miserable, and they're empowering, and they're not discouraging. So it's very intriguing, you know, these profound spiritual states that are, you know, hard for, you know, at least myself as a neophyte, to comprehend. And then there are songs of Lala Samayi, songs of longing and greed where he's asking again and again, when will tears come to my eyes? 
when will there be shivering in my body when I chant? And he expresses again and again, you know, this intense hankering. But again, you know, that is not, you know, the uh, hankering and lamentation of this material world. It's a special kind of ecstasy that Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur also expresses so frequently in his songs. And it's really an expression of Vipra Lamba Seva, which is the hallmark of our Sampradaya. And Nartam Das Thakur was simply plunged in this mood throughout his life. I mean, it's his life in a nutshell, his mood, that he always was, oh, I was born too late. And um, he had this mood, this Vipra Lamba Baba. And um, then other songs, you know, after he's spoken of all this hankering and feeling lonely, and then there's other songs where he expresses fully, full spiritual perfection, where he describes Vrindavan, the Goloka, he says who he is in the spiritual world, <laughs> you know, and he just describes everything in the spiritual realm. And... Um, beyond you know what we can we can just appreciate you know and then there's so many songs of love for the vaishnavas and the spiritual master always in the mood of, always in the mood of him being a servant of the servant and so through these songs he made it possible for everyone to understand Gaudiya siddhanta fairly easily and also you know, we also can know him through these songs. These are his heartfelt expressions. So to know a person, you know, when you read their writing, they put themselves in there, you know, so we can know him through these songs. You know. So Nartam began this songwriting and at the same time he saw that he had, he had a big challenge, you know, there he was in Kateri alone. How was he going to spread Mahaprabhu's mission? And he felt he needed inspiration, so he went on pilgrimage, which is a purpose of pilgrimage, is to derive inspiration for your spiritual life. So um, he went to Navadweep, he went to Puri, he went to Eka Chakra, and wonderful, had wonderful, wonderful experiences. And he got very great inspiration. Um, you know, Srila Prabhupada followed in this mood that he wanted everyone to come to the Dham because he knew he knows that, you know, through going to the Dham, if done in the right mood, you can really make spiritual progress and really derive inspiration. So um, he derived a lot of inspiration, but he also saw as he was traveling, um, he also saw that there was a lot of uh, amongst people that he met as he traveled. He saw, you know, there was confusion. There were misunderstandings. You know, Mahaprabhu had left after he left, of course. There were difficulties and some devotees lost heart. And so he saw all this and he thought, how can I help? And so on his journey, he got this inspiration that he had to bring everyone together. He had to bring them together so that he could unite them and uplift them. And so he decided on the Gorpanima day that he would, he would invite devotees from far and wide. And this has never happened before. It's interesting, isn't it, that this is... Um, I'm not sure how many years after, but I would think that it's at least 40 years after Mahaprabhu's um, departure was the first major Gorpanima festival. And uh, it was a big, you know, big organization was required. And, you know, it's interesting to see, like, this is a lesson. What makes an Acharya you know, that their desire to help others is what, you know, pushes them, you know, the desire to fulfill Lord Chaitanya's mission. And in doing so, they have to be 
innovative and they have to be creative and they have to be dynamic and they have to figure out how am I going to do this now in the situation that I'm in? You know, Lord Chaitanya did that, Rupa and Sanata and Bhakti Siddhanta and I mean, Srila Prabhupada, he just completely broke the mold and opening up everything to the whole world. So, you know, step by step, each acharya tries to, you know, open things further and further for the people of the world. So this was Nartam. He, this was something new. It hadn't been done. It required big organization. And Srinivas had his doubts like Nartam. You've never done anything like this. But Nartam got a big help from his cousin Shantos Dutt, um, who became the king of Ketri instead of Nartam. And um, got a lot of support and Srinivas came and all his friends came. Uh, and all these devotees came from far and wide. And Nartam prepared himself by developing a special new style of kirtan called Garnhati. So as the, this festival, when devotees came from far and wide, it was mega, huge festival, huge preparations were made. And the height of the festival, Naratam came before everyone and he began this special kind of kirtan that was so intense and so pure that like lightning flashing in the sky, suddenly all of the Panchatattva and all the associates of Mahaprabhu, they appeared there amongst all the devotees and everyone could see them and they danced with them. <laughs> And, you know, you, well, you could have very, very long class just to talk about that. But for this, Nartam became the king of Kedri, king of Kirtan, king of Kirtan. And, of course, his, this new style was very beautiful, but it was not about that. It was about the depth of his love. I have a quote um, from Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur that, explains, well, what, what is that real pure chanting that could actually bring the Lord into your presence? And so he's, Bhaktisiddhanta says, I'll read this. Um, you cannot vibrate the holy name simply by moving the lips and the tongue. The pure name of Krishna is not lip deep, but heart deep. And ultimately it goes beyond the heart and reaches the land of Krishna. And when Krishna comes down, the name comes through the heart and moves the lips and tongue. And that vibration is the holy name of Krishna. <laughs> so this is Nartam's style of chanting. <laughs> and so what a wonderful thing he did for us that imagine the impact on our life today. Srila Prabhupada kept this tradition alive of having big Gorpanema festivals and they just grow and grow and grow every year. It's amazing, actually. So these are not, you know, this is something done long ago um, that we're benefiting from. So we, we have to know, you know, thank you so much to Nartam Das Thakur. What would we do without our Gorpanema festivals? Wow. So then the last thing that's very unique about Naratam is his departure. And um, usually we don't talk about the departure so much and you don't even hear, I mean, those stories are not really written down much, but with Naratam it is. And since it is his disappearance, um, really it's so extraordinary that you just can't avoid talking about it. Um, so briefly, after the Ketri festival, um, well, Ketri became famous. People started flooding into Ketri from far and wide. Everybody wanted to come there. Nartam installed six sets of deities there. They had a beautiful temple. And so it was bustling, it was busy. And at some point, Nartam felt that he needed a little solitude. 
So he and his dear, dear friend, Ramachandra Kaviraj, they made a little bhajan stali, just the two of them at a distance from Kateri. People still came to see him. And uh, there they relished each other's company and Krishna Kata together. But then one day um, a letter came for Ramchandra Kaviraj from Srinivasachari asking that he would come with him to Vrindavan. And so Ramachandra, his heart was torn in two, of course. He knew that Nartam, as he grew older, was just getting more and more intensely burning in the fire of separation from Mahaprabhu and his associates. And Ramachandra's company sort of kept him alive. So he was afraid to leave Nartam, but you know, your spiritual master, and he wanted to go to Vrindavan, of course. So Nartam encouraged him, no, don't stay here. Oh, fine. You know, but after he left, Nartam was plunged even more and more deeply into this mood of separation, and all his disciples were very concerned. They wanted to get him out of this mood. So one day, Ganga Narayan Chakravarti, who was one of the prominent uh, disciples of Nartam, he came to Nartam and he suggested, um, why don't we go to my house and we'll go for Ganga Snan? Now, Ganga Narayan's house was quite some distance. It's actually about three hours drive from uh, Mayapur, Jia Ganj. And um, so it was a walk, it, it, was a, it was a journey. And then to their surprise, Naratam agreed, yes, let's go for Ganga Snan. So they were so happy. They were just in ecstasy. They traveled so happily with him and they came to Ganga Narayan's house. It's actually these kind of pastimes here. They're very similar to Srila Prabhupada's departure pastimes also, how he gave great hope to his disciples at one point. But uh, anyway, so when they, they got to the, the uh, they get to the bank of the Ganga and everyone happily goes in for bath and Naratom comes out and then he lays on the bank and doesn't get up. He just lays there. And then everyone began to realize that his intention was to leave his body there on the bank of the Ganga. And Ganga Narayan, um, well, that's, that's a whole story in itself, but Ganga Narayan, eventually he begged and begged and cried and said, please don't leave now. And then Naratam just woke up. <laughs> okay, I'll stay alive. And he did. So I don't know how long he went back to Kateri. And for quite some time, he stayed in Kateri and continued his, his preaching activities. And then one day he called Ganga Narayan. He said, I would like to go for Ganga Snan again. Let's go to your home. And Ganga Narayan was like, oh, no. <laughs> he didn't want it. But you know, disciple has to follow the desire of the spiritual master. So they went and uh, again returned there. And again, Nartam entered the Ganga. And then he asked his disciples to bathe him. So they started pouring water on him. And as they poured the water, he began to dissolve into the water of the Ganga. Now, this is probably one of the most remarkable things in Gaudiya history. I mean, we have heard of people's hearts melting in ecstasy, but someone's entire body to melt into the water. You know, sometimes, you know, we know yogis can leave their bodies at will, but this is something so far beyond that, it, that the intensity of his love actually melted his body. Um, it is just inconceivable. But, you know, he showed us the ultimate in loving intimacy. You know. 
I mean, everybody seeks to expand their experience of love, even, you know, in the material realm and spiritual realm. All the books, all the movies, everything, everyone is trying to increase their experience. Um, but, you know, when you're only dealing with material elements, you just get a shadow, shadow of love. But no real intimacy can be there until it's soul to soul. So what to speak of soul to supreme soul? <laughs> the experience that can be had. It's hard to imagine that emotions can be so intense and so deep. Um, but, you know, there at Jia Ganja is the dude samadhi, the milky substance was taken out of the Ganga and put into samadhi there. And when you go to Naratam Samadhi, that's, that's what's there. That milky, what was left, from his body dissolving into the Ganga. So, you know, he shows us, well, just how far you can go. How far does love reach? <laughs> and, you know, this potential for profound love, you know, it's there in all souls. So these are some things that set him apart as one of the greatest Acharyas of all time. And, you know, what a hero, what a hero. You know, he conquered the material energy and gained entrance to the spiritual realm. Such a powerful person and yet always so humble. You know, so such, you know, such personalities, there are inspiration, there are hope. You know, there really are our key to progress. Um, there's that first you know, Om Tad Vishnu Paramam Padam Sada, you know, that those people, they see the spiritual world so they, they can convey it. They see it, they can reveal it. You know, so when we talk, we have these talks of acharyas, it's a lot more than just nice stories. It's actually just so beneficial for our spiritual growth. It's enriching and purifying. And it's very relevant, you know, because really we, we advance by mercy. I mean, we do our sadhana and everything. It's not that that makes us advance. It's that we attract mercy. And the mercy comes through the acharyas. And so, you know, we need <laughs> to make the connection with them. And we, to, we need to know that this is our family. These are our ancestors. And we can be proud, such heroes the greatest people that walk this earth, you know, we have a connection somehow <laughs> through Srila Prabhupada's mercy. And um, it helps us, you know, when we know our history, we see a bigger picture, we see where we came from and the steps that had to be put in place in order for us to be where we are and have what we have. It just really helps us to be so grateful and to just have so much <laughs> appreciation. So, you know, it's a good day to try to make a firm personal connection with Srila Narottam Das Thakur. All glories to Srila Narottam Das Thakur. Hare Krishna. <laughs>